Well, he'll probably collapse soon. So, take care of it after that. I stared in shock at the man in front of me who said such unbelievable words. It had been several months since my Fiel, Odell, started showing symptoms of dementia. His own son, Teddy, and his wife, Marilyn, were planning to abandon their father and run away from this situation. Odell is a deeply compassionate person who treats everyone kindly and equally. Of course, he had supported and helped me, and surely Teddy and Marilyn as well. And yet, they were going to repay his kindness with such betrayal? Or were they so heartless that they didn't even feel any gratitude? My thoughts, full of growing resentment and anger, remained unspoken. In a time when Odell needed the most support due to his dementia, they were acting selfishly, and I could only glare at them in place of words. Seemingly unaware of my anger, they continued preparing for their move without a care. I tried to voice my complaints about their utter lack of consideration, but they had left for their new place before I could approach them. Reluctantly, I returned to the room where Odell was waiting. Although betrayed by his own son, Odell had a satisfied look on his face and said with a sly smile, I've been waiting for this moment. I am S. Day. I met my husband, Kyrie, through an acquaintance when I was 40. Given my age, I wasn't planning to get married anymore, I thought I'd live freely, enjoying hobbies and travel. But Kyrie and I got along very well. I would have been fine with a common-law marriage, but Kyrie was determined to have a formal marriage, so we officially became a married couple. Upon getting married, I moved out of the apartment where I had lived alone and started living with Kyrie and his father, Odell, in their family home. Kyrie's mother had passed away five years ago, so Odell had been living alone since then. He proposed that we live together shortly before we got married. At first, I thought it was for caregiving purposes and was wary, but Odell was healthy enough not to need care despite his age. Of course, the future was uncertain, but I felt that Kyrie and I could manage caregiving if needed. Moreover, when our cohabitation was decided, Odell suggested dividing the living space to make sure I wouldn't feel burdened. Odell would live on the first floor, and my husband and I would live on the second floor. We shared the same entrance, but Odell did some simple renovations to create a kitchen and washroom on the second floor. This ensured a degree of privacy, so I didn't feel stressed at all. Odell's considerate personality and his kindness towards me were major reasons why I agreed to live together. Though not luxurious, the three of us lived a peaceful life. Then, suddenly, tragedy struck me. Kyrie passed away suddenly. I received the news while preparing dinner. I was puzzled to see a call from his phone while he was still supposed to be at work. When I answered, I heard the voice of a paramedic. They said that my husband had suddenly collapsed at work and was being transported to the hospital by ambulance. After hanging up the phone, I quickly ran to the living area where Odell lived. At this time, He's usually sitting in his chair watching TV, but he wasn't there today. Calling his name as I wandered through the rooms, I found he was apparently sleeping in his bedroom. I hesitated to wake him, but I wanted to get to him as soon as possible, so I wrote a note saying, Kyrie has been taken to the hospital, I'm going, and left it on the living room table. The hospital the paramedics mentioned was about 15 minutes away by car. I hurriedly started the car and headed for the hospital, but by the time I arrived, my husband had already passed away. The event was so sudden that everything went dark before my eyes. The cause was identified as a heart condition, classified as sudden death. In a daze, I listened to the doctor's explanation and then sat down on a chair in the hospital. I don't know how long I had been sitting there. I noticed my phone vibrating and checked the caller. The call was from Odell. Just as I was about to answer, the call ended. Regaining a bit of my senses, I decided to head home for the time being. When I arrived home, I found Odell waiting at the front door. 
I hurriedly parked the car and ran to him. Este! How was Kairi? His face was pale. Seeing him clutching his phone and worrying about his son's well-being, I hesitated to tell him the truth. For now, we went inside and sat facing each other in the living room. Kyrie has passed away. I felt I needed to explain what the doctor had told me about the sudden event, but my throat tightened and I couldn't speak. My heart hadn't caught up with the reality yet. Though he was really shocked by the news of Kyrie's death, he seemed to understand my feelings and didn't force me to speak. We decided to end the day there and talk again tomorrow, after we had some time to come to terms with our emotions. I returned to my room, unable to accept the reality that I would never see my beloved husband again and couldn't sleep at all. Sitting up in bed, I noticed it was already daylight outside. When I checked the clock, it was 9 a.m. Assuming he'd be awake by now, I went to Odell. Entering the living room, I saw he was already sitting in a chair, drinking tea. It seemed he hadn't slept either, his eyes were red and bloodshot. I explained as much as I could remember about Kyrie's death and what the doctor had said. Odell listened with a troubled expression the entire time and finally shed a tear. To think he died before me. Kyrie and Odell were not particularly close, but they seemed to genuinely care for and respect each other. His suggestion to live together was likely to keep his elderly father from feeling lonely. I had once heard from Kyrie that Odell was reluctant to live together because he thought I might feel burdened. Odell, who always prioritized my feelings as his son's wife over his own, continued to be very kind-hearted after we moved in together. Seeing this parent-child relationship, I could sense the depth of a father's love for his son, and it pained my heart. Despite the overwhelming sadness filling our hearts, we had to take care of the necessary procedures as family members. We contacted relatives with the news, arranged the funeral, and handled the paperwork, dividing the tasks between Odell and me. On the day of the funeral, the service went smoothly, and we returned home. Odell then approached me, saying he wanted to talk, so I sat down in the living room chair. Este, what do you plan to do from now on? Will you continue living in this house? Now that Kyrie had passed away, it was just Odell and me in this house. I guessed he was telling me I was free to live my own life as I wished. But like Kyrie, I also held deep respect and affection for him. If it's not too much trouble, I'd like to continue living in this house. It holds so many memories with Kyrie. I see. All right then. Let's continue to support each other. He smiled gently, wrinkles gathering at the corners of his eyes. And so, our life together as two began. The void left by Kyrie's absence could never be filled, but we managed to maintain a peaceful life together. One Sunday morning, the doorbell rang. Since the front door was on the first floor, Odell usually answered it. This day was no different, I heard the door open and immediately after, his startled voice. Wondering what was happening, I went downstairs to find Kyrie's brother Teddy and his wife Marilyn standing there with large bags. What is this sudden visit? What are those bags? We're moving in today. We figured it's tough for you. Teddy said this in a tone that brooked no argument and proceeded to enter the house with Marilyn as if it were the most natural thing to do. I bowed slightly and followed them into the living room. Teddy sat down on the sofa, and Odell asked in a somewhat low voice, What's this about? Moving in together, why so suddenly? From my memory, we had only met at the dinner for our wedding and Kyrie's recent funeral. I had once subtly asked Kyrie about his relationship with his brother, but he had only given me a difficult look and said they were estranged. He also mentioned that Teddy rarely visited even after Odell started living alone. Well, with Kyrie gone, Este must find it hard to take care of dad by herself, right? As his real son, I thought I could be of help. 
I was surprised by Teddy's words, as I had assumed their relationship wasn't very good. Although Odell's expression didn't brighten, he didn't turn them away either. If that's the case, you should have let us know beforehand. Este, what do you think? Teddy and Marilyn said they would be living on the first floor with Odell, so it wouldn't be too much of a burden on me. While I felt a bit uneasy about their sudden decision, I had no particular reason to refuse, so I agreed. It was about three months into our four-person household when Odell started showing signs of change. At first, he would get agitated over things not being in their usual places or repeatedly have the same conversations. Then, Odell, who had always been calm, began raising his voice or suddenly becoming sullen and uncommunicative. I wondered if it could be something serious, so I searched his symptoms on the internet. The results pointed to dementia. Many of the other symptoms matched as well, and my fingers trembled on the keyboard. Odell, who had been healthy and calm for his age, had changed so drastically that I couldn't help but be shaken. I closed my laptop and took a deep breath. When I married Kyrie and decided to live together, I had been prepared for the possibility of caregiving in the future. But that was because he was there. The rapid progression of Odell's condition made me feel increasingly anxious. I thought I needed to get him diagnosed and decided to try taking Odell to the hospital, even though he seemed to be in a bad mood. Odell, let's go to the hospital just once. It will be quick. Shut up. I'm not going to the hospital. What are you planning to do to me? His violent outburst made me flinch. With such a loud, intimidating voice from an elderly man, I couldn't muster the courage to press further. Since I worked part-time from morning till evening on weekdays, I decided to have Marilyn, a full-time housewife, and Teddy, on days he got home early, look after Odell during those hours. On my days off from part-time work, I spent the entire day with Odell. It had been a few months since the dementia-like symptoms began. During that time, his memory lapses worsened, he would ask for meals right after eating, and he started bathing multiple times. Seeing him change so drastically saddened me, and my worries grew. There might be some good medication or treatment. If I left it untreated and the condition worsened, taking him to the hospital would become even more difficult. I decided to consult Marilyn and Teddy, who were home at the time, about getting Odell to the hospital. Can you help me take Odell to the hospital? I think he would listen better if we all convinced him together. Well, I suppose. But isn't it fine to just leave it as it is? I was taken aback by Marilyn's response. Marilyn had shown clear discomfort when dealing with Odell's symptoms. Despite claiming to have moved in to help with caregiving, she had looked annoyed when I saw them interacting. Wouldn't it be easier for Teddy and Marilyn too if we took him to the hospital and got appropriate care from a professional? Their hesitant responses felt off to me. But if we don't take him to the hospital, we won't even know if it's really dementia. When I pressed them strongly, Teddy and Marilyn reluctantly agreed to take him to the hospital. We decided to take Odell to the hospital on a day when all of us were off, which was a week later. And then, a week later. I woke up early in the morning, stretched out, and steeled myself for the day. At the hospital, we would get a diagnosis. There were so many things I wanted to ask the doctor about dealing with dementia, caregiving methods, and the progression of the disease. With Kyrie gone, I felt some anxiety about caregiving alone, but I wanted to support Odell, who had been so good to us, by working together with Teddy and Marilyn. Thinking this, I descended the stairs. Instead of entering the living room on the first floor, I headed towards the front door leading outside. I needed to get the newspaper that Odell always read in the morning. He used to go to the mailbox himself, but since the onset of dementia, someone in the family had been doing it for him. As usual, I opened the front door, but the scene before me was anything but ordinary. 
A moving truck was parked in front of the house, and Teddy and Marilyn were busy loading it. What is this? What's going on? Hearing my voice, Teddy and Marilyn noticed my presence. We decided to move out. Our house is finished. Teddy's casual statement left me in a state of confusion. Today was the day we had agreed to take Odell to the hospital together. We planned to move from the beginning, so honestly, whether he goes to the hospital or not doesn't matter to us. It dawned on me why Marilyn had reacted unexpectedly when I asked for help persuading Odell. They were moving out, so they wouldn't be involved anymore. Remembering that day's conversation, it all made sense. It seemed they had moved into my and Odell's house as a temporary arrangement until their new home was ready. Their sudden departure without any notice and their selfish reasons for leaving made me increasingly angry. What about Odell? What are you going to do about him? Are you just going to leave him in that state? I asked them angrily, but they showed no sign of remorse. You can continue to take care of him as she has been. You've been living together with him so far, so you can handle it, right? The situation is completely different now. It's cruel to just abandon him. At least, you could have helped us take him to the hospital. It's difficult for me to take Odell to the hospital alone, especially when he yells and gets violent at the mention of it. Despite my pleading, Teddy and Marilyn didn't budge. Then, Teddy said something unbelievable. Well, he'll probably collapse soon anyway. So, take care. Teddy turned his back on me with a careless tone, leaving me in disbelief. I never thought Teddy could say something so heartless about his own father. And it hadn't even been a year since his brother Kyrie passed away. His insensitive remark furrowed my brow. Ignoring my stunned state, the two of them got into the truck and drove off to their new home. I stood there in a daze for a while, but remembering Odell inside, I hurriedly went to the mailbox to get the newspaper. Though still confused, life with Odell would continue. Determined to take him to the hospital alone somehow, and then to care for him no matter what, I clutched the newspaper in my hand. Thinking about how to explain the departure of the two, I entered the living room on the first floor where Odell would be waiting, and there he was, sitting and drinking coffee. I was taken aback by the sight. Odell's dementia had progressed to the point where he could no longer make coffee by himself. But today, he was quietly sipping his coffee, unlike usual. It was as if he had returned to the calm Odell from before he had dementia. He glanced at me and then gave a sly smile. So they finally left. I've been waiting for this moment. I had no idea what he was talking about and just stared at him. The more I observed his behavior, the more he seemed like the old Odell. Seeing my confusion, he gestured for me to sit on the living room chair. Obediently, I sat down, and Odell got up and made a cup of coffee for me too. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, Odell, about… Not knowing what to say, I hesitated, and Odell, seeing my confusion, laughed mischievously. Sorry for causing you so much trouble. How was my acting? Acting? I was so surprised that I felt my eyes might pop out. Seeing my astonishment, Odell laughed, showing his teeth, and began to tell me what had happened. It all started a few days after Kyrie's funeral. Teddy had suggested to him that they live together. He had told him that he and Marilyn would take care of him so that I, Kyrie's widow, wouldn't have the burden of caregiving. Odell, thinking of me, agreed to the proposal and moved in with them. However, since Teddy and Marilyn had no money, Odell had to pay for their new house in full. Feeling it was only fair, since they were taking care of him, he paid the cost, intending to eventually tell me and move back to this house. But when Teddy and Marilyn suddenly moved in here, Odell felt something was off, just like I did. Unable to shake that feeling, he overheard Teddy and Marilyn whispering one day. Hey, 
Do you think we can get away with this? Leaving Odell behind and moving ourselves? It's fine. Let's live together in the new, nice house. Dad paid for it anyway. Teddy and Marilyn had made Odell pay for the new house and were planning to live there alone, making some excuse. The joy Odell felt when his estranged son said he wanted to live with him, and the despair of realizing he had been deceived. Just imagining it made my chest ache, and Odell, being the one who experienced it, must have felt even worse. However, he still wanted to believe in his son until the end. So he pretended to have dementia, hoping for a sliver of conscience in the two of them. In the end, that hope was in vain. Marilyn started to despise and mistreat Odell because of his supposed dementia. Teddy, too, showed no concern for his own father. Odell said he resisted going to the hospital desperately, fearing his act would be discovered. I learned a lot of information all at once, and my head was on the verge of exploding. The one thing I understood was that Teddy and Marilyn were cold-hearted people who tried to deceive the Odell who had taken care of them. Still in shock, Odell smiled at me and said, I won't go easy on those heartless people anymore. Not go easy? Are you planning something? Well, you'll see soon enough. He seemed to have something in mind, but I had no idea what it could be. I had been determined to take care of him alone, so finding out he wasn't actually suffering from dementia left me feeling a bit deflated. Odell repeatedly apologized for deceiving me, no matter the reason, and for causing trouble by pretending to have dementia, even temporarily. The reality that he had returned to his former calm self was becoming more evident. I felt relieved that he wasn't ill. Even in the following days, he showed no signs of dementia and the peaceful, quiet times we had shared before returned. A month after Teddy and Marilyn moved out. Odell and I continued to live together, maintaining a good distance and supporting each other. Odell could cook for himself, so we had always had separate meals, but recently his legs and back had been giving him trouble, so I had been cooking dinner for us to share. Today, I was off work, so I went shopping at the nearby supermarket in the early afternoon, thinking about what to make for dinner as I headed home. Rounding the last corner and seeing the house, I noticed a few people gathered in front. Could something have happened to Odell? I hurried to the front of the house. What I saw was Odell arguing with Teddy and Marilyn. Could they be moving back in? The sight of their large suitcases gave me an uneasy feeling. They were talking so loudly that neighbors had started to gather, wondering what was going on. Teddy and Marilyn were too agitated to care about the onlookers and seemed to be pressing Odell about something. If this continued, it would disturb the neighbors and someone might call the police. I approached the three of them, urging them to go inside. Teddy and Marilyn ignored me and kept talking, so I had no choice but to push them gently but firmly into the house. After bowing to the watching neighbors, I closed the door. First, let's calm down and go into the living room. Calm down? How can we be calm? Dad, are you listening? What the hell is going on? Teddy and Marilyn, breathing heavily, confronted Odell. Odell, listening to me, moved toward the living room. Teddy, still complaining, followed and stood in front of the seated Odell. Odell, it's terrible. You sold our house without permission. We've been kicked out. That house was built with my money. It seems you had no intention of living with me anyway. With those words, the excitement that had been causing Teddy and Marilyn to heave their shoulders suddenly stopped. Their faces showed confusion, wondering how he knew that. You misunderstood. Once things settled down, we plan to invite you to live with us. Teddy and Marilyn hastily tried to cover up, but Odell looked at them with an exasperated expression. He explained calmly how he had accidentally overheard them talking about getting him to pay for everything and then living on their own. 
He also explained that he had pretended to have dementia to test their conscience, only to be disappointed by their cold attitudes. So you were just acting today, pretending to be okay. It's terrible that you deceived us. As an apology for deceiving us, give us the money from the house sale. Marilyn's absurd demand made me look at her in disbelief. But Odell, unfazed by Teddy and Marilyn's barrage of words, waved his hand in front of his face. No, I can't give it to you. Este has been supporting and worrying about me all along. I've decided to leave everything to Este. Teddy's face turned red with anger, and he slammed the living room table. The loud, dry sound made my shoulders jump. But Odell remained unmoved, staring coldly at Teddy. Enough! At least give us this house. I'm your real son, it doesn't make sense for a stranger to get everything. That's not possible. We've already made arrangements to clear the land and put it up for sale. Noting Teddy's expression, which seemed to ask why I had the authority to make such decisions, I continued. The house is in my name. Of course, this was decided in consultation with Odell. My sudden interjection seemed to leave Teddy dumbfounded. Originally, the house was under Kyrie's name, but when he passed away, it was transferred to me. Kyrie had wanted to marry me so that, through legal marriage, I would inherit the property. I hadn't anticipated such a situation at the time, but I silently thanked Kyrie for his foresight. They finally seemed to understand that they had lost the house and been abandoned by Odell, their expressions stunned. You have no heart for your parent. To top it off, you tried to swindle money. I can't consider people like you family. I have nothing more to say to you. Get out. Odell's voice, cold and unlike his usual gentle and kind self, delivered the final blow to the two standing in shock. The once furious Teddy and Marilyn now seemed a shadow of their former selves. They made their way unsteadily down the hallway to the front door, and the sound of the door closing with a bang echoed through the house. Since that last meeting with them, six months have passed. I locked the door of my new apartment and headed off to my part-time job. The plan to clear the house and sell the land, and for Odell to move into a facility, had been suggested by him shortly after Teddy and Marilyn left. Though nearly 80 years old, he was relatively healthy for his age. However, as he grew older, there were increasingly fewer things he could do on his own. He probably disliked the idea of burdening me with his care as he continued to decline. Although I told him not to worry about me, his mind was made up. With his savings, he could cover the cost of a retirement home and expressed his desire to move into one. After some discussions, I accepted the proposal. Though it left me with a feeling of sadness. Fortunately, the retirement home he planned to move into was near my workplace. Visiting the retirement home after my part-time job to spend an hour chatting with him had become a daily routine. Odell, hello. How are you feeling? Oh, Este, hello. I'm doing well. You look well too. Odell, now using a cane and appearing much smaller than I remembered due to his bent posture, still had a lively tone and good color in his face, which relieved me. As we talked in the visiting room, other residents passed by, continuously greeting him. It seemed he had become a popular figure at the retirement home, thanks to his inherent friendliness. Since then, Teddy and Marilyn had repeatedly contacted me, begging for money. Their dream of owning a home had become a distant fantasy, and they were now struggling in an old, cramped rental house. They pleaded for financial help in faint voices, but I had no sympathy left for them. By consistently refusing their requests, the contact gradually ceased. I hoped to continue enjoying my visits to the retirement home, chatting happily with Odell, and living comfortably in my clean apartment. This was my heartfelt wish for the days to come.
I'll handle the estate distribution. If you don't like it, we can get a divorce. I was left speechless when my husband Brandon said those unbelievable words to me right after we got home from my mom's funeral. It was truly shocking. To add insult to injury, Brandon placed two pieces of paper on the table and urged me to give him an answer quickly. Furious, I decided right then and there that I would divorce him. Fine. Brandon, who expected me to meekly agree to his proposal, looked confused when he heard my response. But I ignored him and stormed out of the house we had lived in for years. I headed straight to a certain place, determined to carry out my plan. My name is Hannah, and I'm 30 years old. I work as a bank teller and have been married to Brandon, who is five years older than me, for five years now. These past five years have been a living hell for me. Brandon works at a local bank, but his performance is quite poor. He has no motivation for his job and believes that as long as he meets his quota, it's not a problem. This attitude has made him stand out negatively at work. Anyone who works hard at their job is an idiot. It's smarter to take it easy and do things comfortably. When I went to pick up a very drunk him from a company dinner, I was left speechless seeing him make such pathetic remarks to his subordinates. If you only heard his words, it might sound like he's doing well at his job. But having heard about his work attitude from his colleagues, I was completely appalled. Brandon, who never puts effort into anything, is the type of person who looks down on others. He's all about figuring out how to get through each day with the least amount of effort. And he mocks those who work hard. He has no desire whatsoever to get promoted. His lack of motivation and enthusiasm has led his colleagues and subordinates to ridicule him, saying he's likely to be in a position close to being fired in the future. And I was the one he took his frustrations out on. I work as a freelance illustrator. Brandon used to have a sense of respect for me, working in a specialized profession. However, his attitude changed drastically around the time we got married and he found out my annual income. When he realized that being an illustrator doesn't bring in much money, he started looking down on me. I can't believe you had the nerve to say you're an illustrator with such a low income. Your artistic skills are no better than an amateur hobbyist. When we were dating, he used to praise my artwork, but ever since we got married, he's constantly been disparaging it. On days when he had a particularly rough time at work, it would be even worse. He would sigh as soon as he saw my face, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. Must be nice for you, being able to work so easily. Meanwhile, I have to deal with my annoying boss complaining at me every day. Why don't you get a job that actually contributes to our income? Hearing those spiteful comments over and over again, I slowly started losing confidence in my art. But what kept me going were my customers who needed and wanted my artwork. Some would tell me. I gave it to my husband as a birthday present and he was so happy. Others would choose my art as gifts for their children. Even though Brandon would constantly make snide remarks, thanks to my customers who wanted my artwork month after month, I'm still able to continue this job to this day. I often worked in the living room of my home. The living room had great natural light, and when I opened the windows, a pleasant breeze would flow in. This house that my mom bought for me was designed in a way that made it easy for me to focus on my art, and painting in the living room felt particularly wonderful. Just breathing in the outside air and gazing at the scenery through the window would sometimes give me great ideas. However, as if to taint my sanctuary, Brandon started hanging out in the living room at some point. Hey, can't you see that I'm working? You might have the day off, but I'm painting a commissioned piece. If you're going to make snide comments, can you please leave? I can't concentrate. For some reason, he would always come to the living room when I was working. When I observed him to see if he had something to say, 
it was usually just to complain about work or make snide remarks about me. I've had enough and I wish he would stop interfering with my work. When I expressed my true feelings, he grinned as if mocking me. Is that any way to talk to your husband who has the day off? Who do you think is supporting our lifestyle? Even though I don't make that much money, he always uses the fact that my income is lower than his to threaten me like this. I think this started when I made the mistake of having him as a client and opening a bank account for him. He found out how much I earn and have in savings, and his treatment of me completely changed from before we got married. I thought you'd be living a more affluent lifestyle, but it turns out your mom was the successful one and you're a total failure. Your mom must have been so sad, thinking she could pass the company on to her daughter only to end up having to entrust it to someone else because you turned out to be so unreliable. Using the fact that my income is lower than his, he would constantly ridicule and make snide remarks about me. I couldn't stand him. But he's right, I am currently making a living doing what I love. If I wanted to repay my mom, I should have taken over the company. However, after discussing it with my mom, I chose not to go down that path. You should do what you want, dear. I have no intention of making you walk that outdated path of having to do the job your parents decided for you. Do what you want so that you can also pursue what you love. I want to support you in that. Relying on those words from my mom, I forged ahead on my current path. But the more I tried to convey those feelings to him, the more it turned into ugly arguments that drained my energy. Realizing how foolish that was, from that day on, I stopped responding to him. I let his words go in one ear and out the other, letting him say whatever he wanted. Through years of dealing with him, I learned that the easiest thing for my mental well-being was to ignore his nonsense as the words of a pitiful person. When he stopped getting responses from me, he seemed to lose interest and would click his tongue and return to his room. Since it was just words, I became defiant thinking it wasn't a problem if I didn't engage with him. Those were my days of ignoring his remarks, until a sudden event changed everything. My mom, who had been in a care facility, passed away. My mom was the CEO of a major automobile manufacturer with over 7,000 employees. At the time, it was said to be the most popular car maker in the country, and there wasn't a single person in the industry who didn't know my mom's name. Even with her stature, my mom resigned as CEO when I was 28, thinking ahead. She had wanted to pass the torch to me, but when she found out I was focused on my art, she entrusted the company to my best friend Emily. Emily and I have been best friends since we were little. She lived nearby and we were as close as family. My mom trusted her too. However, Brandon doesn't know this fact. Emily had asked me not to tell Brandon that we're best friends. I was torn about whether to tell you since it's a story from our student days. But after hearing about you recently, I thought it would be better to let you know. That's what Emily said before telling me about Brandon during his student days. Brandon and Emily went to the same high school, but they were in different classes and only knew each other's names. Apparently, Brandon was a student with bad behavior who stood out in a negative way. You know how there's always one in every class? The type of idiot who enjoys disrupting the lessons and teasing the teachers. That's Brandon for you. I was in a different class so I never saw it firsthand. But I heard a lot about it from friends. She made sure to visit our home at times when she wouldn't run into him. Since she also got married and changed her last name, even when Brandon saw her at our wedding, he didn't seem to realize that she was his classmate from high school. Thanks to that, even now, he hasn't noticed my relationship with her. I've told him that I have a close female best friend, but he's probably not interested in anything about me besides money. He would just say, do what you want, and leave it at that, never asking about her. I heard rumors back then that he was obsessed with money. 
Some people were making a fuss about how he never paid back money they lent him. So I was wondering if you'd be okay if he was still like that now, but he works as a bank teller and covers your living expenses, right? I figured there was no need to say anything then, so I kept quiet. But to this day, I still only have that kind of negative impression of him. That's why I asked you to keep quiet about me. I don't want him pestering me for money if you carelessly mention me. Seeing Emily smile wryly as she spoke, I let out a sigh. Before we got married, I never sensed that side of him at all. On the contrary, he seemed like a sincere, upstanding young man that even my parents would approve of. That was my first impression of him. Brandon and I met when he came as a customer to an art exhibition I was participating in. At the time, I was feeling stuck with my art and losing confidence. I was spending my days painting while agonizing over whether I should continue. Amidst that painful time, Brandon stared at a painting I had made for hours. Um, you've been looking at that painting for a while now, right? While other paintings were garnering interest and attention from customers, he was captivated for hours by a painting that no one else paid any attention to. His behavior made me curious, and I found myself calling out to him. I'm sorry, was it no good? No, not at all. I was just wondering why I can't stop looking at this painting. Brandon has no artistic sense. But I think it's precisely because he lacks that sense that he said what he did next. I don't get it. To be honest, I have zero interest in artistic stuff, but for some reason, I can't take my eyes off this painting. Even when my friend who invited me here told me it was time to go, I couldn't move from this spot. That's how drawn in I am by this painting. I'm sure the person who painted this must have felt pain and anguish, repainting it over and over. I don't know why, but ever since that thought occurred to me, I haven't been able to move. I don't know the first thing about art, so I must sound ridiculous right now. As Brandon scratched the back of his head with a wry smile, I was completely captivated by him. I felt incredibly saved by those words from him, someone who knew nothing about art. To have someone who understood my anguish and saw through it. Realizing there was nothing that could make me happier, before I knew it, I had revealed to him that I was the artist. This sparked the start of my interactions with him. Even Brandon, who had no interest in art, would come visit every time I said I was submitting a painting to an exhibition. Would it be okay if I visited your studio next time? I'd love to see you painting. I was so happy that he was taking an interest in me. At the same time, I also became interested in him and invited him to my home. And then, he confessed his feelings to me. I want to keep watching you painting freely by my side, just the way you like. I had never met a man who would say something like that to me before. Genuinely happy, I accepted his confession and we started dating. I thought for sure we would have a blissful time together. My dad and mom, who were still alive at the time, were overjoyed to learn that I had a boyfriend. My mom was so elated that she even reported it to her friends. You were always such a passionate girl when it came to art, never even having a boyfriend. Nothing could make me happier than knowing you've found someone to be happy with. That's right. And I'm in this state. If there's someone who will look after you, I can pass on with peace of mind. At the time, my dad had cancer and had received a terminal diagnosis. Even so, thanks to his determination to at least see my wedding, I was able to safely show him my wedding dress on my big day. Perhaps reassured after seeing that, my dad passed away after the wedding ceremony ended. As if following after my dad, my mom's health also declined, and she entered a care facility when I was 31. There were no issues with her mind, but she didn't have the physical strength to live on her own. After entering the facility, my mom never regained her vigor. And finally, the other day. I can finally go to where your dad is. She said, 
leaving behind her last words before passing away. I was shrouded in grief, unable to focus on painting for a while. That's when Brandon, for some reason, was drinking alcohol in high spirits. Finally. Now you'll be getting that old hag's inheritance, right? It's been a long time coming. I was starting to get tired of playing the role of your good husband. Drunk or not, I couldn't believe the words coming out of his mouth. Shocked by his words, I asked him to repeat what he just said. What are you saying? Are you in your right mind? He drank a considerable amount at the wedding venue too, so I thought maybe it was just the drunken ramblings of an intoxicated man. But even so, the words he just said were unforgivable. As I frowned and asked him to repeat himself, Brandon grinned mockingly. Of course. If I don't suck up to your parents, I might not get any inheritance. Isn't my name written in a will? Surely at least a little bit must be left to me, right? Who has it? The lawyer? Anger welled up inside me as he laughed. My parents just passed away and I'm emotionally drained, yet what is this man saying? Talking about money at a time like this? I felt utter despair at his unbelievable insensitivity. Stop it! Don't talk about that stuff so casually. Can't you tell the difference between what's okay to say and what's not? I don't usually express my emotions so strongly to Brandon. But this time, I couldn't hold back. Hatred surged within me for Brandon, who had been putting on a good face for my parents all this time for the sake of inheritance, only to show this attitude as soon as they passed away. As I listened to Brandon only thinking about money, what came to mind was the story Emily had told me about his past. I heard rumors back then that he was obsessed with money. So that story from his student days was true after all. The moment I realized that story was definitely true, my feelings for him turned cold in an instant. Why are you yelling so much? I was enjoying my drink and now you've gone and sobered me up. Brandon's reaction, as if I had ruined the mood, only fueled my irritation. I had put up with things until now because he had always treated my parents well. But if this was all part of his plan from the start, then wasn't his marrying me and pretending to be interested in my art all in act two? I started questioning his every action. That's when Brandon did something shocking. The next day, when I went to the living room, he was unusually up early, lying in wait for me. He was completely sober, the alcohol having worn off. When I looked at him suspiciously, wondering if he had something to say, he told me to sit across from him. I did as I was told, sitting on the sofa across from him, staring at him and trying to figure out what this was about. Then Brandon placed a signed divorce application on the table, along with what looked like an affidavit, and abruptly started an unbelievable conversation. I was drunk yesterday too and couldn't have a proper talk. Let's discuss this properly now that we're sober. Did you have the lawyer confirm the details of the will? I couldn't comprehend how Brandon could talk about money the day after yesterday. Didn't he remember me telling him to stop? And that remark yesterday calling my mom an old hag. How much does he actually remember and how much was said in the heat of the moment? No, even if he said it in the heat of the moment, I won't forgive him for insulting my mom. I won't let him act like those words were never said. With that thought, I unleashed my fury on him with a fierce attitude. Yesterday, I clearly told you not to bring that up, so how can you talk about it so casually? You called my mom an old hag and you're not even going to apologize for that? Don't get so angry. It's making my head hurt. If you don't like it, I'll apologize. My bad. That good enough? What's with that attitude? My anger only grew at his insincere apology. I continued to take him to task over it for a while after that but Brandon showed no sign of remorse whatsoever. 
He just kept giving half-hearted apologies and we couldn't come to a resolution. Realizing this wasn't going anywhere, I stopped questioning him and brought the conversation back to the inheritance. I haven't contacted anyone or heard anything. Besides, we still need to sort through her belongings. How could I possibly think about the inheritance before that's even done? Mom just passed away. I see. Well then, sign this affidavit for me. What? When I looked over the affidavit he handed me, I was astonished by its contents. What is this? It stated that I would swear to leave the entire distribution of the inheritance to Brandon and not interfere at all. Moreover, it clearly noted that breaking this would result in divorce. I was at a loss for words at the unbelievable contents. I'll handle dividing up the inheritance. If you don't like it, we're getting a divorce. The inheritance that becomes yours is mine too, right? So it's my prerogative what I do with your stuff. What's yours is mine, and married couples share assets, don't they? I'm saying I'll take care of it for you since you can't do the work yourself. You should be grateful. The moment I heard those words, my patience reached its limit. I got up with my face downcast, and without signing the affidavit, I went to my room and started hurriedly preparing to leave the house. Hey, wait. What are you doing? Sign it. If you don't, we're getting divorced, you hear me? Yes. I hear you. That's why I'm preparing to leave the house now. What? He must have assumed I would quietly sign it. Seeing him rendered speechless by my opposing response, I almost felt like laughing in spite of myself. Hey, what nonsense are you spouting? Divorce? That means we're splitting up, you know? You understand what that means? I just said I understand. I'm sorting my things so don't get in my way. The years of pent-up frustration and discontent had nearly reached my breaking point when I saw him yesterday. And this contract was the final straw. There's no way I wouldn't divorce him over this. Leaving a flabbergasted him behind, I hurriedly started packing. He tried to stop me from the side. But I wouldn't even look at him. Desperately floundering for some way to stop me, he probably didn't have the composure to calmly assess the situation. Making sure he didn't notice, I took the divorce papers and left the house I had lived in for many years. Well then, thank you for everything until now. Wait a minute, hold on! Ignoring his voice calling out to stop me, I got into the pickup car I had arranged for in advance and escaped to my parents' home and to carry out a certain plan, I headed to the bank where Brandon worked. Oh, you're Brandon's wife, right? Brandon had been taking time off every day to sort through the estate. And now, the wife of someone like that had suddenly shown up at his workplace. It was only natural for them to look surprised. Thank you for your hard work. Is the branch manager here? I have something I'd like to discuss, so I'd appreciate it if you could call for them. I called out the branch manager and told them something with a big smile on my face. Hannah, what brings you here? Branch manager, I have something I need to talk to you about. The bank started buzzing with the sudden report of our divorce. Ignoring the shocked reactions around me, I continued speaking. I want to close the account with $3 million in it and please close the personal account I had made as well, right now. I don't think I'll be needing your services here anymore. What? The branch manager couldn't hide his surprise at the sudden request. Another employee who immediately realized this was a huge problem must have called for Brandon. Still in his loungewear with bedhead, he rushed to the bank in a fluster. Hey, what are you doing making decisions on your own? Now, now, calm down. For now, please come to the reception room. You too, Ms. 
The branch manager led Brandon and me to the reception room. The remaining employees were looking at Brandon with agitation, and I could hear some of them talking about him in hushed voices. Perhaps feeling flustered by the unpleasant attention he was drawing, he glared at me. However, I wouldn't meet his gaze at all. Maintaining my resolute demeanor, I silently followed after the branch manager. Eventually, we were shown to the reception room. Brandon and I sat next to each other as the branch manager, who had no idea what was going on, asked about the situation. Um, what do you mean you want to close your accounts? Exactly what I said. I want you to close all the accounts I have with you. Hey, what the hell? Closing accounts? I didn't hear anything about this. Well, of course he didn't. I had come to tell the branch manager about closing the accounts without saying a single word to Brandon. As I looked at him in exasperation, thinking what an obvious thing to say, the branch manager explained the situation to him once more. She said she's divorcing you and wants to close all the accounts she has with us. What's going on, Brandon? I never heard anything about you getting divorced. No, I don't accept this divorce either, and we're not actually divorced yet. Hannah is just saying whatever she wants. By the time I thought how dense can he be? I had already burst out laughing before I could hold it back. Seeing that, Brandon glared at me as if to say, What the hell? What are you talking about? We are divorced. I signed my part of the divorce papers that were in the living room and submitted them. You! What? As expected, he hadn't noticed that I took the divorce papers from the living room. Upon learning that the divorce papers had been accepted, he let out a shocked cry. The branch manager also looked confused, having no idea what was going on, and stared at us. You signed them first, didn't you? Why are you so surprised? Didn't you take action because you wanted to divorce me? I also thought I couldn't go on with someone like you, so the timing was perfect. Our interests align, and the divorce papers have been accepted, so naturally there's no division of assets. The house is still in my name too, so please move out within three days. Otherwise, I'll sue you for forced eviction or unlawful entry. Wait a minute. What do you mean you went ahead and finished the divorce proceedings on your own? Anyone can see that was just in the heat of the moment, or rather, you only used that to get me to sign that affidavit. Affidavit? Even though a fight had started, the branch manager was watching over us. He probably thought if he intervened carelessly, he might get dragged into it. But perhaps out of surprise the moment the affidavit was mentioned, he blurted out. What do you mean? And stared at Brandon. However, there's no way Brandon could honestly talk about that. Even if he was incompetent at his job, he made up for it with his good interpersonal skills. If he talked about this, even that lone strong point of his would be given up on, and his social credibility would plummet. He might even become unable to stay at his workplace. Noticing that Brandon was keeping quiet out of that fear, I gleefully shared the details with the branch manager. Actually, my mom passed away, but he shoved an affidavit in my face with threatening content saying if I didn't let him handle the inheritance distribution, he'd divorce me. That was the last straw for me, so I divorced him. What? No, that's not it. I just got a little greedy, I didn't actually intend to make her do that. It was supposed to be a joke. He desperately tried to make excuses to mislead the branch manager, but there's no way those would reach his ears. The branch manager gave him, whose actions deviated from human morality, a disappointed look. Noticing that gaze, he was at a loss for words, racking his brain on how to deal with this disadvantageous situation. But there's no way I would let him do that. To corner Brandon even further, I said, Did you really think I would laugh off your joke? 
The night before, you insulted my mom, calling her an old hag, and you even declared that you were only being nice to my parents for the inheritance. Did you forget about that? I gave him a nasty grin as if to provoke him, revealing facts that lowered his value as a person. Upon hearing that, the branch manager stared at him with contempt. Flustered by that gaze, he became visibly agitated, his face turning pale. I dealt him an even bigger blow. So with that being said, please close all the accounts I had made with Brandon as the account holder, as well as the account holding the $3 million I had saved up while single. $3 million? He probably thought there would be no damage if it was just his own accounts. But the moment he heard there was an account with $3 million, Brandon cried out in surprise. How the hell do you have that much money? There's no way you could make that much with those old-fashioned paintings, right? It's simple. Painting isn't my real job. What do you mean painting isn't your real job? In response to the perplexed him, I let out a deep sigh. Then, I took out a business card from my bag and handed it to him. This is my real job. Painting was just a hobby, like a side gig. CEO! You took over that old hag's company? Brandon reflexively covered his mouth after calling my mom an old hag right in front of the branch manager. But it was too late. The branch manager glared at Brandon, who lacked any decency, with a stern expression. I thought Emily was the president of that company. Why are you the CEO? How do you know about her? I never once mentioned anything about the company, right? I also kept quiet about knowing her, so how did you find out? Beads of sweat suddenly formed on Brandon's forehead as if he was flustered. To him, I revealed the shocking truth I had heard from Emily. The answer is simple. It's because you were trying to entice Emily for her money, right? Emily called me just now and told me you contacted her on social media, bringing up my mom. Saying that, I played a recording of the phone call that I had made with her permission. It contained details and evidence of the day he contacted her including messages that sounded like he was trying to lure her into an affair. The branch manager grimaced at the unbelievable revelation, and Brandon turned deathly pale. He was completely at a loss for words. You didn't know Emily and I were friends. You probably just thought she was an acquaintance who had taken over my mom's company, nothing more than that, right? Well, too bad for you. Emily and I have been best friends since we were little. The reason I kept quiet about being the CEO was because I had a feeling something like this would happen. Learning the truth, Brandon was unable to retort. You see, she is what you call a salaried manager. The company belongs to me, the owner and CEO. Even if you tried to entice Emily without doing your research, your position is already finished. As I laughed mockingly at him, the branch manager who had been listening cleared his throat and spoke while glaring at Brandon. Brandon. I now have a clear understanding of how you behave at home. It's extremely disappointing. Thanks to you, our bank's sales will likely drop significantly. Branch manager, please wait. I'll talk it over with her now and make sure to resolve this. So please, would you just stop it? I have nothing to discuss with you, and my decision to close my accounts remains unchanged. The moment I said that, the branch manager turned to me. In that case, and he proposed an idea. If I fire Brandon from our bank, will you hold off on closing your accounts? What? Brandon had an unbelieving expression at the branch manager's shocking statement. I also hadn't expected him to suggest that, so I turned my gaze to the manager, showing interest in his proposal. We'd prefer not to have you close your accounts. If we had to choose between continuing your contract and continuing to employ him, it's clear that we value the contract with our customer more. He's notorious for poor performance at work too, 
and we've been having trouble figuring out what to do with him. We have no need for an employee who can't be trusted by society or as a person, so if you'll agree to continue your contract with us, we'll fire him. That's a violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act. I'll sue you for that. Hearing those words, the branch manager started exposing his bad reputation one after another. Go ahead and try if you think you can. In exchange, we'll also sue you for all the despicable acts you've committed against our female employees and your high-handed treatment of your subordinates. Don't make the mistake of thinking I know nothing. If you're going to take action, we'll hire a lawyer too and respond accordingly. Realizing that the branch manager and I had noticed every single thing, he completely lost heart and fell silent. He held his head in his hands as if regretting his actions. This wasn't supposed to happen. Why? Ignoring Brandon as he muttered those pathetic words, I directed cold words at him. Actions taken to use others for your own greed will always come back to haunt you. All of this is your own responsibility, so reflect on it and accept your punishment. And so, my long battle with Brandon came to an end. After that, he was fired from the bank and moved out of my house. He clung to me until the very end, crying and begging me to withdraw the divorce, but the moment I shouted that I would call the police, he got scared and fled back to his parents' house. However, I had already spoken to my in-laws beforehand, so Brandon ended up being disowned by them. Of course, there was no way I would let it end there. I consulted a lawyer about the moral harassment I had endured up until now and submitted the evidence I had secretly collected. Through my lawyer, I decided to demand a settlement. Emily also demanded a settlement for his persistent attempts to lure her into an affair and his harassing remarks. Brandon, who had been after my mom's inheritance, had hardly any savings due to his extravagant spending and is now living in poverty. Apparently, he lives in a small, old apartment and works from morning to night to pay off his debts. Having regained a peaceful life, I am now fulfilled in both my work and private life. Hannah seems so energetic lately. Both her paintings and her expression have become brighter. I guess it's thanks to Emily being by my side and supporting me. I'm getting good ideas now and I can't help but enjoy painting. Even I could tell that my painting skills had improved considerably. One of my customers, an antique art dealer, highly praised my work. Thanks to that, the popularity of my paintings grew and I was eventually able to hold a solo exhibition. Thanks to the company as well, sales steadily increased, and it has now developed into a world-class automobile manufacturer that attracts global attention. In between my painting work, I also support Emily's work at the company, and together we now protect the company my mom left behind. I'm Kate, a 28-year-old office worker. I live with my husband, David, and we don't have children. I work at a publishing house, specifically in sales, promoting our company's books. It wasn't the department I had hoped for, and it was stressful, but I managed my daily work. My husband, David, worked at one of the sales destinations. When I first went there for sales, you have a tough job, don't you? He said, and I inadvertently ended up venting about my work frustrations. David listened without showing any sign of annoyance. As we saw each other often on my sales visits, we grew close and started dating. David was kind and caring, always willing to listen to my work troubles even after we got together. Being with David made me forget about the daily nuisances. After about a year of dating, he proposed me, and we decided to get married. However, a while after getting married, I fell ill due to work stress. I felt I should go to work, but I just couldn't get myself out of bed. It turned out to be a mental illness, and there were many days I couldn't go to work. I couldn't burden the company any longer, and with David saying, I'll support you, it's going to be alright. I decided to quit my job. I knew you were struggling with work, 
I'm sorry I didn't realize sooner. As he said so, I burst into tears. I was grateful for being married to him. However, living on just David's income made us anxious about our future. Even a part-time job would have helped, but at that stage, I didn't have the confidence to work. That's when we received news. My grandmother, whose legs had weakened, felt uneasy living alone and decided to move in with my parents. My grandfather had passed away a few years earlier. They lived in a two-story house, which was too big for my grandmother, especially since she barely used the upper floor. She also decided to stop driving. Knowing about my health and job situation, my grandmother offered to give us her house and car. The house, recently renovated, was beautiful, and the car, a nearly new vehicle bought just before my grandfather passed, was in excellent condition with low mileage. They had bought it outright, so there was no loan for us to worry about. Considering our situation, we gratefully accepted her offer. Getting a house and a car in that time was a surprise, and he was extremely delighted. Eventually, I became a full-time homemaker, still not fully recovered. I pawned to focus on homemaking until my health stabilized, then I consider return to work. I wanted to do housework perfectly, but my health didn't recover quickly, and sometimes I couldn't manage it well. There was a time when I spent entirely in bed. Even though we had a house and a car, we still relied on his income and lived frugally. Initially, he was as kind as ever. When I said, I'm sorry, I can't do the housework perfectly even though I'm at home. It's okay, don't push yourself. That's what he said. He would even cook meals for both of us and do the housework, despite being tired from work. I felt terribly guilty. However, as time went by, his frustration seemed to grow due to our constrained lifestyle and my inability to do much housework. He started to become harsher with me. One day, during a minor argument, he yelled. You couldn't even live without my income. The part one was most concerned about, I never imagined kind David would say such a thing to me, and I was left speechless. Until now, he would say. Don't worry about it. But to think he felt this way inside was a shock to me. From then on, David, perhaps thinking I couldn't retort in my current state, started to behave as he pleased. Even though we were barely making ends meet with the living expenses he had been contributing, he began to contribute even less. When I asked why he wasn't contributing to the living expenses, he said, You're not savvy enough with saving. That's why I'm putting in less intentionally, to make you practice saving. There was no way the living expenses were enough, so I tried harder than ever to save, but it was no use. When even the food budget became insufficient, I pleaded with him to increase the living expenses. I asked, Hey, the food budget isn't enough. Can you increase the living expenses, please? But he replied, Stop nagging, like I said before, you're just not clever enough. I'm foregoing things I enjoy just to contribute to the living expenses. I continued to argue, as there were parts one couldn't accept. But David, you go out drinking with colleagues and on your days off, don't you? I can't go anywhere, and I haven't bought clothes for myself in so long. David was unyielding. A person who doesn't contribute income and uses poor health as an excuse to laze around at home doesn't have the right to buy whatever they want. Be grateful I'm even contributing to the living expenses. If you're so upset, get a job and buy whatever you want. Though, that's probably impossible. He continued in this manner. Following this, whenever I tried to argue or give my opinion, he would reduce the living expenses, and I became more and more unable to talk back to him. Moreover, he started coming home later than before, or not until the morning. One day, when I confronted him about infidelity, he brazenly said, So what if I am? And he threatened me. If you have a problem, we can just get divorced. Indeed, a divorce would leave me struggling to live. I couldn't go back to my parents' house as my grandmother was living there, and they had no room for me. David knew this and used it to his advantage. Each time he dangled divorce over my head, I would fall silent, and he became even more brazen, no longer hiding his infidelity. Whenever I looked displeased, he would mock like, What? 
You want a divorce? Another day, I asked him. Sorry, I need some money for the doctor today. David answered with an annoyed expression. Again? How much is it this time? I need to get some more medication, so about $50. I replied hesitantly. Seriously? What a waste. I work hard for this money, and it's being taken for some mental illness, $50 at a time. Mental illness is all in your head anyway. I bet you're just using my money to enjoy a fancy lunch or something. He loudly exclaimed. I naturally objected. That's not true. And whenever I go to the doctor, you always demand the receipt and insist on getting back every cent in change. How could I possibly use it for myself? To which he retorted. You're really good at talking back for someone who's useless. I'm letting you use my money to go to the doctor, so it's only right I get the change back. You waste money on unnecessary medical expenses and now you're asking for the change too? You're so greedy. He then grudgingly threw the doctor's feet on the floor. I picked up the money in silence, feeling my love for him growing colder. In such circumstances, my mental health couldn't possibly improve. These painful days continued, and the only outlet I had was writing about my struggles on my blog. Then, a decisive event occurred. One morning when I woke up, I couldn't find David anywhere. On the desk, there was a note saying, I'll be away from home for about a week. Left $30 for a week's living expenses. In a panic, I called David. Where are you? You're not going to be away for a week for work, right? Are you with another woman again? And how can $30 be enough for a week's living expenses? What are you thinking? I confronted him. To which David replied. Stop nagging. It's a vacation, a break. Anyone would be stressed with a do-nothing, complaining woman at home. And to think you, who receives the money, dares to complain it's not enough. Be grateful I left any money. He said this as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Then he blocked my calls, and for the rest of the day, he didn't respond to any of my attempts to contact him. Feeling utterly hopeless, I received a call from David the next day. David said, I forgot to say this yesterday, but I'm sick and tired of you. It's over, we're getting a divorce. I'm giving your car to another woman, so leave the house immediately. Have your things packed before I return and don't you dare show your face to me again. I was so shocked that I asked him to repeat himself. What? What are you talking about all of a sudden? I don't understand. And giving away my car and telling me to leave the house. Isn't this house and car originally my grandma's? David retorted. They're mine too since you received them. I can do whatever I want with my own things. And if you're going to talk about money, consider the cost of the house and car as repayment for all the times I've supported you. If you don't like it, pay back all the living expenses I've put into this house at once. Can't do it, right? Pack your things and get out before I return. And fill out the divorce papers yourself. After ranting, he blocked my calls again. I had reached my breaking point. So, I decided to take a certain action. Two days later, he contacted me. Have you left the house and the car yet? If not, hurry up. I replied cheerfully. Yeah, I've already moved out. Good. My girlfriend and I will be living in that house from now on. He said with a happy tone. However, unfortunately, that's not going to be possible. When he heard my response, he fell silent for a moment. What are you talking about? Are you not only mentally ill but also lost your mind? I stood my ground. No, I'm perfectly sane. And the house and car you're planning to use with your girlfriend are no longer available. I told him clearly. He yelled even louder. What do you mean? The house and car were originally my grandma's. So, I consulted with my grandma and decided to sell both the house and the car. The car is already gone, and while the house still exists, you have no right to use it. I explained calmly. That's right. While David was enjoying his affair trip, 
I couldn't bear it anymore and talked to my grandmother and parents about everything. Until now, I hadn't consulted them because I had quit my job due to illness and didn't want to cause any more trouble. My grandma asked, Why didn't you tell us sooner? And my dad said, Don't worry about not having a place to stay. We can prepare a place for you to stay. It's a parent's duty to help their child in a pinch. My mom agreed. And I broke down in tears as the burden I had been carrying was finally lifted. Together, we decided to carry out our plan. First, I decided to temporarily move my belongings to the house where my parents and grandmother lived together. I had very few possessions, as I rarely had the opportunity to buy things for myself. On top of that, the house and car my grandmother had given me were still in her name, so I decided to sell them with her permission. Fortunately, both the house and car were in good condition and quickly found buyers. David, with a voice trembling in anger, said, You're doing whatever you want. What are you thinking? Well, it's grandma's right to do whatever she wants with her stuff. But as you wish, we'll get divorced. Of course, I'll make sure you pay the compensation. I replied unfazed. After a moment. Compensation? Why should I have to pay something like that? David exclaimed. It's obvious since you're at fault. You thought I couldn't talk back, so you didn't even try to hide your affairs, making it really easy for me to gather evidence. Thanks for that. It looks like there were several, including some married ones. Let's talk through lawyers from now on. I calmly answered. David was speechless for a while, not expecting such a counterattack from me. As the silence continued, I said, Well then, and was about to hang up the phone. But then, but what about your future life? You said there's no room for you in the house where your parents and grandma live. And if you sell the car, what about transportation? David retorted. I replied, Oh, don't worry about that. My stuff is at my parents' place for now, but I've already found an apartment to rent. It's in a location with good transport, so I don't need a car. Then he asked, How do you have money for that? You haven't been working. Our savings must have dwindled during the time I didn't give you money, right? I told him in a cool voice. So you knew that and still treated me like that. You're the worst. By the way, what you did was completely economic abuse. I'll add that to the compensation. David raised his voice even more. Economic abuse? What's that? I was providing for the household, so that can't be it. I replied exasperated. You really don't know anything, David. Economic abuse includes giving less than the necessary amount for living expenses. It also includes extreme restrictions on how I use my money and spending despite my requests to stop. Thankfully, you were kind enough to send me those instructions in messages and notes, so they're all evidence. I've also been keeping a detailed household ledger and diary. David muttered. What's that? Then I continued. And don't worry about my future life. I'm about to receive about three times your annual salary soon. Until then, I'll borrow money from my parents. David said. Uh. And lost his words again. In fact, I had been writing three blogs daily about my painful illness, my husband's emotional abuse, and about saving money. I always loved writing, and since I spent a lot of time at home due to poor health, I used to write in bed to somehow relieve my stress. Surprisingly, all three of my blogs became popular and their viewer kept increasing. I was then able to earn income through blogging, such as affiliate marketing. Unbelievably, I got offers to publish books based on all three blogs. There was a time lag before I could receive this income, but I had finally made arrangements for the money to be transferred, which allowed me to take this bold step. It was more like enduring until that income arrived. Furthermore, I had originally worked at a publishing company because I had a dream of becoming a novelist. I wanted to do any job related to writing. After receiving the book deal, I also got an offer to write a novel series. When I told him about this, he seemed even more shocked. 
it was natural, perhaps, as he never thought I could retaliate like this, especially losing to me in terms of income, which he thought he controlled. He exclaimed, But if you have that much income, you don't need compensation from me. Are you saying I should lose my house, car, and family? You're the worst. Don't you feel like supporting me with that income in the future? He was still making a fuss. Finally, I said, That's a different matter. So, this is really goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your affair trips. And this time, I really hung up the phone. After that incident, I spoke with a lawyer and was able to get compensation from him. As I had told him, there was enough evidence of his affairs, emotional abuse, and economic abuse, so I received a significantly higher compensation than usual. He had little savings left, as he had been giving all the remaining money after minimal living expenses to his mistresses. He used to say to her, If you come with me, I'll have a house and I'll give you a car. His mistresses easily abandoned him once they realized he no longer had a house or car, which he had promised to them. According to what I heard through the lawyer, David is now leading a very difficult life, without a house or car, and with the additional burden of paying the compensation. He's still trying to negotiate a reduction in the compensation amount, which is just ridiculous. Currently, he's renting a place by borrowing money and can't make ends meet with his current income, so he's also doing part-time jobs along with his regular work. Later, through the lawyer, he said, I want to get back together. Let's marry again. But of course, I declined. Now, I live as a writer, my original dream. Initially, I was financially supported by my parents and grandmother, but I have paid them back. I'm now thinking about building a barrier-free house to live with my parents and grandmother in the future. After covering my son Paul's wedding costs, why only $10,000 for your son's big day? If you're the parent, you should pay the full amount. Right after that, my husband Donald, who had never yelled before. Shut up, kid. Wah. Just $10,000? For my wedding party, that's it? My son, whom I've cherished more than my life, started laughing as if mocking us. If you're the parent, pay the full amount. Poor thing. Is this really my son? After divorcing my ex-husband, who was drunk and harmful, I remarried Donald, and we've been happily living as a family of three. Gentle and kind Donald warmly and strictly raised Paul, who was not his blood-related son. To anyone looking, they were father and son, very close. Like his father, my son grew into a kind and gentle boy and successfully became independent as an adult. Living together since his marriage, the life of just the two of us after our son left felt somehow fresh. While enjoying a calm life, suddenly, we got the news that our son had married. It was so sudden and, moreover, we were informed after the fact. Though surprised, we accepted it since he was an adult, but his wife seemed to come from a wealthy family. But that's not what concerned me about her. To put it nicely, she's outspoken and unafraid to speak her mind. To put it poorly, she's insensitive and blunt. Perhaps her personality has influenced my son. As far as I knew, my son was not the type to act that way even after receiving money. He was not the kind of child who would disdainfully call his parents poor. Shock and surprise made my mind go blank. Is this person really my son? I'd rather be told he's just a stranger who happens to look like me, it would be easier on my heart. At that moment, a loud bang echoed as the table was struck, and my usually calm husband erupted in anger. Shut up, kid. His eyes were filled with a contempt and anger I had never seen before. I and Mary got married at the age of 25. Soon after getting married, we were blessed with a child, and I raised our child as a housewife. It was when our son Paul was one year old that I divorced my previous husband, Robert. It's Mary's fault for making me angry. Cut it out already. When drunk, he would curse at me like that, 
punching and kicking around the house, throwing things. His bad drinking habit seemed to worsen day by day, and it seemed he was becoming more intolerant to alcohol. In addition to yelling loudly, he seemed to throw things to further intimidate me, and there were times when I was hit and injured. Even then, Can't you even dodge? It's not my fault. Once, he threw a glass at me while I was holding our son. I instinctively shielded my son. The glass hit my temple and broke. That was when I decided to divorce. Fearing that Paul might get injured someday. Robert's drinking problem was only getting worse, and I couldn't guarantee that something life-threatening wouldn't happen someday. I was determined to protect my son, but if something were to happen to me while we were still married, this man would become the guardian of my son. I couldn't guarantee that he wouldn't commit a life-threatening assault. I had to avoid such a terrifying scenario at all costs. So, bleeding from my head, I rushed to the hospital open at night, holding my son, and had them make a medical certificate. We discussed the situation further at the hospital and decided to have them contact the authorities on our behalf. This action officially recognized my son and me as victims of abuse and successfully introduced a third party between Robert and me. Robert was very charming in public, always acting like the perfect husband whenever anyone else was around. Especially when he wasn't drinking. That's why it was crucial to have an outsider involved. Eventually, the divorce was finalized. Robert said, I was just sad that Mary stopped prioritizing me after our child was born. But it just showed how self-centered he was, a disappointment to the end. He only made the first payment for the settlement and child support, which was a few hundred dollars, and then stopped. I tried to follow up initially, but after he started avoiding me and reacting angrily, I gave up. I never really had high hopes to begin with. After the divorce, I approached the company I worked for before getting pregnant, explained my situation, and asked if they could rehire me, and they did. So, I managed to secure enough income to keep us from poverty. What's important is spending time with my son and staying healthy enough to continue working. To do that, I knew I needed to eliminate stress from my life. I want to live with Mary and Paul. The person who stood by me through these trying times was Donald, who joined the company after I had left. I couldn't believe a man in his mid-twenties, for years younger than me, with no history of divorce or children, would say such a thing to someone like me. I want to date you Mary, but I also want to get married soon. You shouldn't speak so lightly of marriage. At first, I couldn't trust Donald. I thought his youth meant he had an idealized view of marriage and wasn't thinking it through. For someone who had already failed at marriage once, those were not the words I wanted to hear. When we get married, we can always be together, and we can share the chores and take care of Paul together, right? Plus, to truly become Paul's father, I need to marry first. Is it to become Paul's father? Of course, I love you Mary, but I also think of marrying both you and Paul. I was at a loss for words. I hadn't thought he felt that way. Was he serious? I want to share the same responsibility for Paul. I think that's what it means to stand by you Mary. And I hope to be included as well. Seeing him smile, I felt the ice around my heart begin to melt. Donald always considered me and Paul together. He never just asked me out for a meal after work, instead, he would offer to help carry groceries and even bring them to our apartment. Lately, when I had to leave work early because I wasn't feeling well, I'll pick up Paul from preschool on my way back from my rounds, so please call the preschool. He'd say, and he'd even bring back dinner for Paul and me. Paul was very fond of Donald, and seeing them laugh together made me happy too. By marrying, I gain a lot of rights. To be a husband, a father, a family member. So, please marry me, for my sake.
I knew he phrased it that way so as not to burden me, but hearing him say it made me very happy. So, when Paul turned three, Paul and I decided to remarry Donald. Even though there was no blood relation, Donald and Paul had a close father-son bond. We never told Paul they weren't blood-related. It wasn't that we tried to hide it, there just never seemed to be a need or an opportunity to mention it. Because to us, they were undoubtedly father and son. Because they were unmistakably father and son. Donald gave Paul both kindness and strictness. Our household gained another earner, which brought us a bit of financial leeway, allowing us to build a respectable house, though not a mansion. Paul grew up healthy without major illnesses, went to college, became a working adult, and now he has moved out and is living on his own. Currently, Donald and I live together in this house, working. This is the first time we've lived just the two of us since we met, and it feels a bit odd, but I think spending time together leisurely isn't too bad. It's been a few years since our son Paul started working. One day, out of the blue, we got a message. I got married. I'll come over with my wife this weekend. It was quite the surprising news. We hadn't even heard he was dating anyone, and now he's married. He mentioned they are planning a party and will set a date once everything is decided. Well, he's an adult now, so as long as he takes responsibility for his decisions, that's fine but getting married without any prior notice was indeed a shock. I wondered if there was some urgent reason, like a pregnancy, but that wasn't the case. Our son has always been a bright and kind boy since childhood. Though he had his moments of rebellion, he was always able to reflect on his actions, so he never really behaved too badly. There was never any cooling of relations within the family, and even after he became independent, he frequently came home to share meals just like before. So, Donald and I were both puzzled by this sudden announcement of marriage. Welcome back, Paul. I'm home. This is my wife, Jessica. On the weekend, Paul came home with his wife. The woman named Jessica, standing next to Paul, smiled and nodded slightly. She was slim, with a gentle demeanor, very beautiful. Please come in. I called out to Paul and Jessica, and they entered the room, following Donald down the hallway. I ended up bringing up the rear, but noticed Jessica scanning the house as she moved. Though she followed behind Paul, her gaze flitted restlessly to the stairs and closed doors, and this behavior didn't change even after entering the living room. It was strangely unsettling to watch someone scrutinize another's home so openly and my curiosity was as piqued as my discomfort. What kind of person was this woman? We sat down at the dining room table to talk. Paul mentioned that Jessica was two years his junior and a newcomer who had joined the company this spring. Being 25, she might have transferred from another company. Jessica's parents are well-known corporate chairpersons, and she grew up in a home always attended by housemaids, who took care of everything for her. In other words, she came from wealth. This information all came from Paul, while Jessica sat quietly beside him, not uttering a single word. Would you prefer coffee or tea? What kind of work do you do at the company? I hear you're thinking of having a party. Any preferences for the venue or theme? Even when asked such questions, Jessica would just cover her mouth and whisper to Paul. He would answer on her behalf, and Jessica would smile with narrowed eyes. It was incredibly frustrating. Jessica, I know we've just met and you might be hesitant, but feel free to speak up, okay? Donald must have felt the same way. Unable to hold back, he said this, but Jessica remained silent, just smiling with her mouth covered. The pattern of Paul speaking for her continued. We're just here to report today. And they left rather quickly, without us ever hearing Jessica's voice. It's just, well. After the two left, Donald and I could only look at each other and mutter. Are young people these days really like that? 
No, even the new employees at the company aren't like that. They don't even introduce themselves. They don't make proper eye contact. Not a word of greeting or thanks. Yet, they unabashedly stare around the house, and when we give them a parting gift, they don't say thank you, nor do they feel ashamed for coming empty-handed. It's really strange. Feels like meeting aliens. In any case, the sense of discomfort is very strong. If they're married, all the more reason. It's another household, after all. If Paul and his partner manage on their own, that's all that matters. I think so too. Maybe just keeping in touch to a reasonable extent is best? Donald seemed to feel the same way. He says with a wry smile. Neither of us wants to live together, nor do we have a strict view about our son's wife. So, we both thought that meeting up occasionally would be just right for both parties. That's what I thought, but for some reason, Paul started coming home frequently with Jessica. Maybe because they don't live far away, so it's an easy trip. However, Jessica still doesn't speak a word. Even if I ask something, she whispers to Paul, and Paul answers. Naturally, the conversation doesn't get lively, but the frequency of them having dinner at our place or staying over has increased, and honestly, it's nothing but stress. Today, while I was preparing dinner, I got a message from Paul saying, We're coming over. Given the timing, I had no choice but to ask if they were planning to have dinner, and of course, the answer came back as if it was expected. Paul and Jessica stay holed up in Paul's room upstairs, not helping with the preparations. Ever since he was young, Paul was always eager to help me with meal prep. Now that he doesn't, it feels bittersweet. I'll go call Paul and the others. After getting help from Donald to get dinner ready, I decided to go upstairs to call the two of them. I really wonder about this. As I went up the stairs, I could hear a voice. Not Paul's voice. A woman's voice I hadn't heard before, so it must be Jessica. This was the first time I heard her speak. Isn't this too old-fashioned? Is this house second-hand? No, it's not. Your father and mother are so plain, and both the house and the people seem poor. It's depressing. My first thought was, so this is her true nature. Though I was infuriated by her rude remarks and scornful complaints, it felt like the unease I had been feeling deep down was finally clear. If you don't cut ties with such an old-fashioned family home, it's divorce for us. Yeah, I'll think about it. Afterwards, I casually found the right moment to call out from outside the room, and the four of us spent a dinner time that wasn't as lively as usual, with Paul and Jessica just eating before leaving. Sigh. I'm disappointed in Jessica's personality and Paul's lack of judgment. But what irritates me the most is Paul saying he'll think about it after being told it's divorce unless he cuts ties. Over post-dinner coffee, just Donald and I, I shared exactly what I had overheard before dinner. I'm mad at Jessica for casually throwing around the word divorce, and at Paul for considering cutting off his parents and his childhood home. Easy now. Let's calm down a bit. As my anger slowly grew with time, Donald tried to soothe me by stroking my back. Putting his wife first isn't a bad thing for a husband to do. I guess so. They're young, so maybe they can only see things from their perspective right now. Let's wait and see a bit longer. True, considering they're newlyweds. Jessica is young and was raised in a wealthy family. I'm disappointed Paul chose someone like her, but it's fine. Paul's life is his own. After all, even if we're family, we're different people, it wouldn't be strange for our paths to diverge. That's an extreme view, but if it comes to that, we can't do much. Paul is kind at heart, and maybe he'll manage to bridge the gap between Jessica and us. Donald's faith in Paul was evident. Raised by the ever-calm Donald, 
who never resorted to unjust anger or raised his voice. Paul had grown into a considerate and gentle young man. I trusted him too, but couldn't shake off a feeling of unease about what lay ahead. We've decided on the details for the party. Want to talk about it tomorrow? So, as usual, Donald and I welcomed Paul and Jessica into our home. We sat at the dining table, and as usual, only Paul spoke. Paul, this. I placed an envelope filled with cash on the table in front of Paul. Use this for the wedding party expenses. This money had been saved since my divorce. With a determination to protect Paul no matter what came our way, even if it meant saving little by little for him. Donald knew about this savings account, and since our remarriage, had suggested we contribute a fixed amount monthly. We had already taken out insurance for Paul at the time of our remarriage and were making monthly payments. This savings was partly for my own satisfaction, funded from money I could spare, so there were times I couldn't contribute. Still, we had reached our goal of $10,000. That's why I thought it was the right time to give it to Paul. Paul took the envelope, opened it, and looked inside. For my son's big day, just $10,000? Those were Paul's words. Jessica leaned over to peek inside. If you're the parent, you should pay the full amount, poor thing. Paul sneered mockingly, his mouth twisting unpleasantly, with Jessica making a similar face beside him. My mind went blank. Is this really my son before me? I didn't expect tears of joy. But I hoped it would be helpful for Paul. Shut up, kid. A loud bang on the table and a shout. It was Donald. Both Paul and Jessica were startled, frozen in shock, but so was I. Donald had never raised his voice like this before. Now's a good time to say this, Paul and I have no blood relation. Huh? Paul's surprised voice echoed. It made sense he'd react that way. We had never mentioned it before, and I hadn't expected Donald to reveal it at such a moment. Paul has been with us since he was two years old, and when he turned three, Mary and I remarried, making Paul officially part of the family. Paul was at a loss for words. Mary divorced her ex-husband to protect Paul. I had told Donald everything. The records of dealings with the authorities during the divorce. The medical reports and photos of injuries. Photos of the destroyed home were all shown. Even when Mary was injured by her husband's violence, she protected Paul at all costs. She divorced to avoid any harm coming to Paul. That was when Paul was one year old. The ex-husband ran off without paying any compensation or child support. Naturally, there was never any contact from him wanting to see Paul. That was what Mary couldn't forgive the most. She worked hard and saved this money for Paul. Even after marrying me, she continued saving in that bank account from the money she was free to use. Despite there being hardly any leeway, I thought of this bank account as a self-satisfaction, fulfilling my selfish parental pride by doing something for Paul. After marrying Donald, we were financially more comfortable. We didn't have to worry about daily expenses. We could buy necessary school supplies when needed. We were able to get insurance. We could pay the tuition fees without delay. All thanks to Donald. But since Paul is my child, I wanted to do something for him. I may not be blood related to Paul, but I love him as my son. I truly believe that. I think Donald and Paul are like real father and son. But in a different dimension, Mary loves Paul. It's incomparable to me. I think it's meaningless even to compare. It's embarrassing to have it put into words again, but I think it's true. Paul is more precious to me than my own life. I've felt that way since he was conceived. Then what did you say just now? Say it again. I'm sorry. 
When Donald raised his voice to question, Paul apologized just as loudly. Really, I'm sorry. That's right, I vaguely remember. The old apartment we used to live in when I was little, and moving out from there. Do you remember? You only lived there until you were three. It was when Donald and I moved to a spacious condominium when we got married. Sorry, thank you. Mom and Dad, thank you. Paul, looking us straight in the eye, had the same kind face of the gentle son he's always been. Really, I'm sorry. I'll think it over again. We'll plan a ceremony that we can actually afford, just the two of us. What? Wait a minute! The one who cut in was Jessica. It was the first time she spoke up in front of us. I'm not changing the plan, okay? I actually want to add more options. There are so many more things I want to do. Jessica, shouting at Paul, was nothing like the demure image she had presented. Selfish, hysterical, and self-centered. We live this modestly, so you must have saved more money, right? It's your son's wedding, so pay up. Jessica then directed her hostility towards me as well. I wasn't surprised by Jessica's words, but what an outrageous woman she was. I sighed before deciding to speak up. Paul just said it, didn't he? We should consider within the budget of both your savings and what I can contribute. Are you kidding? If it's going to be such a poor-looking party, better not have it at all. Then maybe it's best not to have it? No, if there's no party, then there's no point in getting married. It was utterly illogical. Where should I even start to make them listen? How much is the party costing now? $80,000. $80,000? How much can you two contribute? Suddenly, Jessica fell silent. She shifted her gaze to Paul. I can only manage $10,000. Jessica says it's impossible for her. If Jessica's family is wealthy, couldn't you ask them for support? Jessica's parents said they wouldn't give any money. Jessica was told you'd understand why. Wasn't her supposedly a rich family? Yet, why wouldn't they pay for their daughter's party? Donald and I exchanged puzzled looks. When we all stared at Jessica, waiting for her to explain, she made a face as if she'd tasted something bitter. Jessica. It's impossible. But why? I overspent a bit. On what? Dad's credit card. Jessica gradually answered Paul's questions. It turned out Jessica was given a credit card by her father as pocket money, which she used for shopping. However, her spending spiraled out of control, maxing out the credit card limit, and her parents were furious. Realizing they had spoiled her too much, they decided not to give her any more money, no matter the situation, to make her experience earning her own money. She was placed in the same company as Paul through a family connection. Yet, it seems Jessica hadn't saved anything at all. Living at home, she shouldn't have had living expenses, but the habit of spending money as if it were infinite was hard to break. That's why Jessica's parents decided not to contribute financially to the party. They probably believe it won't be until Jessica adopts a normal sense of money that this stance will change, but for now, it's deemed impossible. Then $80,000 is impossible. That's why you should ask your real family to pay. Paul whispered his feelings meekly, but Jessica pressed him loudly. Didn't I say? If we don't share the same view on money, we can't get married. There's no point in marrying someone who doesn't have money. I have no use for poor people. Jessica is the poorest here. What did you say? Jessica was infuriated by Paul's blunt words. Probably the last thing she wanted to hear. After calling my family poor, 
To think you're the poorest is just ridiculous. Anyway, let's apologize properly. Of course, I need to apologize too. If you don't have money, there's no use for you. We're getting a divorce anyway. Jessica's attitude seemed nothing more than a string of whims, and Paul's response became sluggish. It must be exhausting when the conversation goes nowhere. Why did Jessica marry Paul? So, I decided to ask what I wanted to know. She seemed capable of answering. I wanted to marry someone from the same company. Why someone from the same company? If you marry someone from the same company, you can quit your job, right? I see. That used to be quite common. When colleagues from the same workplace got married, it was often the woman who quit. Maybe that culture still exists at Paul and Jessica's company. I don't want to work anymore. If I get married, I can quit, right? I can't quit right now because of the wedding guests, but I'm quitting as soon as the party's over. It felt wrong on many levels, but at least it was clear that Jessica's parents' intentions weren't getting through at all. What a pity. Why did you always whisper to Paul and let him do the talking? I was simply curious. I couldn't understand why she would do such a thing. It's because I didn't want to talk to someone who reeks of poverty. I didn't want to be tainted by it. Plus, they'd listen if it's their son talking, right? I was amazed that there were actually people who would say something like this, a clear mistake. At this point, there's really no saving her. Jessica, can you explain this? I took an envelope from the cabinet behind me and spread its contents on the table for Jessica to see. It was several photos. In all of them, Jessica was pictured, but she was arm in arm or embracing men who were not Paul. And each photo featured a different man. Jessica, what is this about? It's what I want to know. What is this? Jessica panicked at Paul's question but I wasn't about to let it slide. These are evidence of your affairs, aren't they? What? Are you serious? Did you hire a detective? Correct. When I heard Jessica threatening divorce if my son's ties with our family weren't cut, I wondered why she would so easily resort to divorce. The discrepancy between her public facade and her true nature seemed too large, raising my suspicion. So, I had a detective investigate, including any affairs. The results were striking. Or perhaps more aptly, they were a complete miss. It appeared she had been dating several men, hiding the fact that she was married. Are you dating these men to get them to buy you things? Of course! If I can't buy them myself, someone else has to. Is there a need to go to hotels? Shut up! Shut up! It's none of your business! Jessica seemed resigned, not bothering to hide her actions anymore. This concerns me, though. Paul spoke in a low voice. Jessica flinched but soon glared at Paul with sharp eyes. We're getting a divorce! Of course. And I'll be seeking compensation. Why? You should know why. Paul glared back at Jessica. Her assertive stance seemed to leave her speechless, and she stood up abruptly. I'm leaving. I've had enough. With those words, she stomped off and left. The sound of the door closing echoed, and we all sighed deeply together. Paul and Jessica's divorce was finalized without issue. Though we sought compensation, the likelihood of receiving full payment was slim. Worse, Jessica had accumulated debt from purchasing expensive bags and shoes that she had insisted Paul buy for her, with Paul co-signing the loans. Given Jessica's likely bankruptcy, all debt repayment responsibilities would fall on Paul, potentially demanded in full due to his guarantor status. 
After consulting with a lawyer, it seemed manageable through debt restructuring, so that was the planned course of action. Although they divorced, the obligation to repay the debts didn't disappear, and having to pay a large amount of debt for a woman he no longer loved is a sad tale. However, it can only be considered an expensive lesson learned. All I did was have a lawyer send letters to Jessica's affair partners. The letters insinuated that they might be liable for the debts Jessica incurred during the marriage, questioning if they were okay with that given their involvement in her adultery. This led to all of Jessica's affair partners, now aware of her misdeeds, coming to the company demanding repayment for the money they had spent on her. Then, all meeting face to face, they started another commotion, which eventually made the company aware of the situation. Jessica, who was disowned by her own family, seems to be living alone in a cheap and old apartment. Home sweet home. Welcome back. Dinner's ready soon. Yay! I'm going to wash my hands. After the divorce, Paul started visiting home occasionally, just like before, spending time with the family. Actually, I was pretty angry about the whole situation and was thinking of banning Paul from coming over for a while, but after he came to our house alone later. I'm truly sorry. He apologized sincerely. I thought to myself that an apology doesn't fix everything, still feeling angry. It's okay. Mary and I both love you, Paul. Donald said with a gentle smile, so I couldn't stay mad any longer, and things went back to normal. Have you finished paying off your debts? Yeah, managed with my savings. But now I've used them all up. That was brave of you. The thought of the interest rates sent shivers down my spine. Well, I guess I deserved it. While having dinner, we talked about such things, and Paul chuckled. Despite the tough times, seeing him accept and overcome his mistakes, able to talk about it like this, made me think my son has grown as a person. Mom, can I have some more? Of course. Living with just Donald and occasionally having Paul come back home, I felt happy that the three of us could spend time together just like before. Thanks for taking care of my daughter this past month. I'll come pick her up tomorrow. What are you talking about? Sherry, my sister-in-law, who had been traveling for a month, seemed still to be at the airport, as I could hear the sound of boarding announcements through the phone. In contrast to my calm response, she began to panic. Wait, what, no, what are you talking about? She's there, right? I left Daisy in your condo's garage. Daisy is her daughter, my niece. I haven't seen her, what are you talking about? Don't play dumb. I sent you a text, so you know. I haven't received any text. You're lying, I know you're lying, don't play with me. Sherry screamed over the phone, panicking. What are you going to do about it? I left Daisy with you. You're responsible if anything happens. After hanging up once, Sherry tried calling Daisy's child safety phone, but not being able to reach her, she continued to panic. She called me back, even more frantic, so I suggested she might want to go home first. You're right. That's a good idea. Upon her return home, she found her husband Leon, Daisy, and me, the three of us together. Sherry seemed to want to ask why the three of us were together. Sherry, I've just been hearing all about it from these two. What? At Leon's words, she turned pale. My name is Bonnie, and until a few years ago, I worked a regular office job. Upon turning 40, I became independent and started working as a freelance illustrator. With the increase in income, I now live alone in a condo. My work is primarily home-based, and I only leave the house for essential errands like going to the grocery store or meetings with clients. I'm not married, nor do I have a partner, but I'm satisfied with my life. Friends sometimes ask if I'm lonely, but I've never thought about it that way, I'm more fulfilled by my work and have no plans to look for a partner. I do worry about old age a little, but I think to myself, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it, to which I'm surprised at my own optimism. 
Today, after meeting a deadline for an illustration, I took a break at 3 p.m. and looked at the calendar. Then, I realized that my brother Leon's birthday was coming up soon. Leon, five years my senior, works in sales at a major publishing company and often goes on long business trips. Sometimes, he brings back souvenirs from his travels. Last month, he dropped by and brought some cookies as a souvenir, so I let him in, made some coffee, and we enjoyed the cookies together. I keep telling you, you don't need to bring anything for me. Buy more for Sherry and Daisy. But I need to see your face from time to time. Don't want to find you laying on the floor. Leon has always been like this, considerate or meddlesome, but it's one of his good traits. Sherry and Daisy are his wife and daughter, therefore my sister-in-law and niece. I haven't told Leon, but I find Sherry a bit difficult to get along with. She's very bright and always dresses fashionably, with her nails done and in the latest trends, giving off a very glamorous impression. It's not that I mind that, but she often looks down on me for being single. At a family gathering at Christmas, she laughed upon learning I had neither a partner nor a love interest. Hey, are you the type who thinks you can afford to wait because you're always young and beautiful? Don't you know about the marriage boat? I think marriage and romance vary by individual. It's not necessary to have a partner. She laughed again at my response. I couldn't tell if it was the alcohol or what, but she kept teasing me about the same thing, and it became tiring to deal with. When choosing a condo to live alone, being away from Leon's family was definitely a criterion, that's how much I was fed up with her. However, I got along well with my niece Daisy. She turned 10 this year and seems to go to school carrying a cute light blue backpack. I haven't seen her in it, but she told me about it when she came to visit. Bonnie, you're so good at drawing. Daisy, who had been watching me work on illustrations, was impressed and stared at the drawing on the computer screen. Wow, I wish I could draw too. Oh, want to try? Really? Yeah, there's still plenty of time before the deadline, so you can have a go. Daisy sat in front of the computer and excitedly started moving the pen. What she drew on the screen was her light blue backpack. She mentioned it was heavy because she also carries a tablet in it. Considering it's even heavier with a water bottle in the summer, I was really impressed by how strong she was despite her small size. According to Daisy, Sherry spends her days as a housewife, and when Leon is away on business trips, she does whatever she pleases. For dinner or lunch on days when school is out, they eat frozen meals or pizza delivery. I'm the one who always does the laundry, and mom only does it once in a while. Really? Yeah, and she gets really mad when my shoes are muddy after P.E. Why? What does mom do at home? She's always on her phone or watching TV. Daisy tries not to upset her mom by staying in her room or going out to the park or the library. Hearing this makes me wonder about parenting, but it's tricky to know if it's my place to say anything. There was another time when the family gathered, and I saw Sherry scolding at quiet Daisy harshly. I think Daisy had spilled some tea, but I thought it wasn't something to get so mad about, it could easily be wiped up with paper towels. Mom is scary, she gets mad at everything I say, so I just keep quiet. Daisy's offhand remark about her mom as she was leaving, after drawing her light blue backpack, stuck with me like a splinter. I remembered that day was a sunny weekend, and Sherry had left Daisy with me because she was going on a day trip with her mom friends. I never imagined receiving a similar text on my mobile phone just a few days later. The autumn leaves in the nearby park had deepened, and it was getting to the point where you missed the warmth of the sun, that kind of coldness had arrived. When I returned to my condo after running a small errand, I saw the silhouette of a girl standing alone by the parking lot. She was wearing a light blue backpack, and I was surprised to recognize her face. Daisy? When I called out to her, her anxious eyes looked up at me. It was indeed Daisy. What are you doing here all alone, and what's with the luggage? Next to her was a small carry-on case, making it look as though she had run away from home. M. Mom said to go to your house. Seeing my confusion, Daisy gestured towards my bag, saying, on the mobile phone. Perhaps there was a text on my mobile phone. 
I hurriedly took out my phone from my bag, and indeed, there was a text from Sherry, albeit recently. Bonnie, sorry for the sudden request. I'm going on a trip with a friend for a month starting today, please take care of my daughter. After reading it, an inarticulate exclamation escaped my lips, but I quickly closed my mouth. Of course, it was out of confusion, but considering Daisy was probably just as bewildered, we decided to go inside. Once inside, Daisy's cheeks were as red as apples, and her hands were very cold. I made her some hot cocoa to warm up a bit and offered her some snacks while listening to her story. Up until a short while ago, Daisy had been drawing in her notebook in her room. Sherry entered Daisy's room without knocking, handed her a carry-on case, and said, Daisy, get ready, we're going to Bonnie's house. Mom won't be home for a month, so bring your backpack, okay? Understood? Okay. Thus, Daisy quickly packed her notebook, pencil case, textbooks, and tablet into her backpack. During this time, Sherry was on the phone, seeming quite restless. Really? That's great! Don't tell me, are you drinking already? It's too early! Sherry's voice was high-pitched and filled the house. Hearing her mother's unusual laughter from downstairs, Daisy covered her ears. After the phone call ended, Sherry's voice returned to normal, and then Daisy was left at that place with her luggage. When Daisy got out of the car, Sherry explained to her. Be good, I'm leaving you with Bonnie for a month. She was told to wait here and had been waiting under the cold sky. Despite the sunlight, it was quite a cold season. Thinking about what would have happened if Daisy had caught a cold made me feel a rising anger at the situation. But does Leon? I mean, Dad know about this? I don't think so. Mom doesn't seem to contact Dad much. She told me so as she munched on chocolate cookies. While I thought how cute she looked with cookie crumbs on her cheeks, I felt it was wrong not to inform Leon and decided to call him later. Bonnie, I don't want to be with Mom anymore. Suddenly, Daisy said this while staring at the rim of her juice glass. The girl who had been happily eating cookies now had a troubled look, far too mature for her age. Why? Because mom gets angry easily, and she throws things at me, like the trash can. I hate it. The trash can? I haven't done anything wrong. She says I'm in the way, tells me to get lost, and throws things. My teachers at school won't believe me either. I can't stand it. Tears were streaming down her face. It must have been very hard for her, as she continued to cry, and I spent the time soothing her back and offering tissues until she calmed down. Clearly, what was happening to her was not normal. Convinced of this, I decided to call Leon to see if he could come back and help. Stepping away for a bit where Daisy couldn't see, I pondered how to explain the situation to him, then an idea came to me. All right, this might work. I murmured softly and dialed Leon's number. What? Daisy? Yeah, yeah, what did you say? Leon seemed quite shaken as he listened to the story, his voice trembling slightly. At first, he joked, saying it must be a prank, not funny, but as I continued, he believed me and listened seriously. When I shared my idea for a plan I had come up with, Leon agreed to it, saying he would take time off work to help. All right then, please take care of it. Don't worry, Daisy is in good hands. I hung up, then quietly deleted the text from Sherry from my mobile phone. Looking towards the living room, I wondered if Daisy had calmed down and quietly went back. I should splurge a bit and treat her to something delicious tonight. With that in mind, I slowly returned. The school Daisy attends is a bit far from here, but I explained the situation to the school and arranged for her to take the bus. This way, carrying her heavy backpack, including her tablet, would be a bit easier. Planning to bill Leon for the bus fare later, I continued my work from home during the day. Daisy doesn't have any extracurricular activities, so she comes home right after school to do her homework. Bonnie, can you check my homework? I was surprised, isn't that what teachers are for? But according to Daisy, it was different. All my classmates have their moms check. I always did it myself. Realizing Sherry had always put herself first, I picked up a red pen. After checking her homework, 
It was time to prepare dinner. When I stood in the kitchen, Daisy followed, saying with her eyes, I want to help. Today we're making meatloaf, so, could you start by peeling the onions? Sure! Daisy was surprisingly quick at peeling onions, and she efficiently followed directions to help cook. I wondered where she learned to cook so well, but there was no time to ask as the meal was ready before I knew it. As these days repeated, we enjoyed our time together, and before we knew it, a month had passed. Looking at the calendar, I anticipated Sherry's call, and sure enough, it came. Bonnie, thanks for taking care of my daughter this past month. I'll come to pick her up tomorrow. What are you talking about? I replied calmly. Sherry, who had been traveling for a month, seemed still to be at the airport, as I could hear boarding announcements through the phone. Wait, what, no, what are you talking about? She's there, right? I left Daisy in your condo's garage. I haven't seen her, what are you talking about? Don't play dumb. I sent you a text, so you know. I haven't received any text. Are you sure you're not mistaken? You're lying, I know you're lying, don't play with me. Sherry, seemingly panicked, screamed over the phone. What are you going to do about it? I left Daisy with you. You're responsible if anything happens. I'll call Daisy to see what's up. With a sharp tone, she angrily hung up the phone. After a while, another call came in, and Sherry was yelling again. Sherry tried calling Daisy's child safety phone, but not being able to reach her, she continued to panic. Sherry, why don't you go home and calm down first? That's true. You're right, I'll go home now. After that, there was a forgotten hang-up, and voices arguing could be heard, Sherry and presumably a man, but it was too far to make out clearly. The room returned to silence, ominously quiet as if before a storm. When Sherry finally came home, her footsteps thundered down the hall. Entering the living room, her face went from a demonic frenzy to a pale shock. It was because she found all three of us in the living room, Leon, Daisy, and me. Sherry's mouth moved as if to ask why the three of us were together, but no sound came out. Sherry, I've heard everything from these two, and about that call earlier. What? I put the phone on speaker so we could all hear. I thought it would make it easier to discuss what comes next. By the way, Daisy's child safety phone was turned off, so it was natural that Sherry couldn't reach her. How could you do this? That's my line. I said I didn't know earlier, but we've been taking care of Daisy for a month. How could you just leave her at someone's house and go off on a trip suddenly? I sent a text about it. That's not the point. Leon carefully chose his words and spoke calmly. Let's all calm down, Daisy is here too. Sherry, it's true you left Daisy and went on a trip by yourself. Your attire and luggage look like you've just returned. Sherry was dressed in a warm coat and stylish outdoor clothes. With lots of luggage, perhaps from shopping for souvenirs and clothes, her carry-on looked full. Without denying, Sherry started making excuses. Yes, I went on a trip. I just wanted a break from being a housewife, the laundry, cooking, it's all the same every day, I was stressed. It's not too much to ask to go out with friends. Is this the friend you're talking about in these emails? I presented several sheets of paper. They contained email exchanges between Sherry and what appeared to be her affair partner, discussing plans for their trip. Dating back to last spring and even on the day I took care of Daisy for one day. The supposed day trip with mom friends was a lie. Sherry covered her mouth as if realizing her mistake. Actually, a few hours before Sherry arrived, at Daisy's request, I had looked through Sherry's computer and found these emails in her mailbox. Daisy had noticed her mom frequently texting someone not her dad and suspected the affair. Her suspicion turned to certainty when she saw texts from an unknown man on her mom's phone while she slept. Also, when Sherry was on the phone, she could occasionally hear the other person's voice, but it wasn't her dad's voice. I heard from Daisy six months ago that Sherry was having an affair. I had been skeptical until Sherry suddenly announced her trip a month ago, but after checking the computer, I realized Daisy's intuition was right. You could see Leon was visibly shaken. What have you done? 
I trusted you, and you leave Daisy with Bonnie to go on a trip for an affair? Leon confronted Sherry with a trembling fist. It's a misunderstanding. I was forced to go on that trip by him. Forced? You left your family for a month for that? Come up with a better excuse. I was threatened. Believe me, Daisy, you believe me, right? Daisy, suddenly addressed, responded calmly and plainly. Mom, you were so happy on the phone before you left. And you made me do all the cooking and cleaning while you just slept and lazed around. Daisy glared with her lips pursed. And you tell me not to stay up late, but you'd go out at night and come back in the morning to sleep on the floor. Everything you said was inconsistent. Hearing this, Leon pressed further. Going out at night? You were partying? It's not like that. Daisy, stop talking. I quickly showed Leon the photo on my mobile phone. It was a photo captured of Sherry, who was dressed up and heading out late at night. Several months ago, I got a call from Daisy, and since I happened to be nearby, I took this photo, but I was surprised too. Where were you trying to go at that late an hour, Sherry? Oh! She was confronted with the photo, and perhaps realizing she could no longer make excuses, slumped down right there. I can't believe it. I can no longer entrust Daisy to you. Let's get divorced. I'll demand alimony. From now on, you're free to be with that other man. Leon said so with his shoulders drooping and then turned his back on Sherry. What? A divorce? You're kidding, right? Why? Don't you feel sorry for Daisy not having her mom around? What about you, Daisy? Come on, help mom out. No, absolutely not. Bonnie feels more like a mom. I felt very embarrassed as an adult to see Sherry cry to her own child but Daisy brushed her mom off. While I was taking care of Daisy, I made time for her as much as possible, discussing school, hobbies, future dreams, and various other topics. Of course, cooking together was one of those things. Sherry, don't worry. I'll make sure Daisy is happy. I said with a smile, and Sherry hung her head dejectedly, saying nothing more. Six months later, her divorce from Leon was finalized, and custody went to Leon. Sherry, dragged by her parents, went back to her hometown. The man she had an affair with, whom she met on the internet, disappeared as soon as he found out about the divorce, and communication was cut off. By the time she realized she was just played, it was too late, leaving her with a hefty alimony and child support bill. Her savings were far from enough, and she managed to make the payments by having her parents bear more than half the burden. However, that led to stricter surveillance from her parents, and she could no longer go out late at night. Moreover, the rumor that she got divorced and came back home without her daughter spread throughout the neighborhood and she was met with cold stares when walking outside during the day, so she rarely left the house. Still, she couldn't remain unemployed forever, so she would have to re-enter society at some point, but what happened after that is unknown to me, Leon, nor Daisy. Leon and Daisy have moved out of their original home to rent it to someone else and are now living on a different floor of the condominium where I live. They plan to use the rental income for loan repayments and savings for Daisy. I've started visiting them almost every day. Leon, who was often away on business trips and couldn't be near Daisy, regretted not being able to pay more attention to his family and focusing too much on work, decided to change jobs. Changing jobs in his 40s was supposed to be a challenge, but his sales performance was excellent, and his communication skills were high, so it was not surprising that he could have held a position of some responsibility. Therefore, his job search did not drag on too long, and six months, he received job offers from two or three companies and starting work at one of them. I was surprised that Leon had such abilities, but what surprised me more was that he preferred outside sales at his previous company and gently declined promotion offers. It wouldn't be interesting to stay on the same company floor all the time. For that reason? But the new job is fully remote, right? Yes but talking with various people is interesting in its own way. Most importantly, being with Daisy is the best. Daisy is still going to school with her light blue backpack. Moving changed her school district, requiring Daisy to transfer schools. 
Though it must have been sad to say goodbye to her friends and teachers, Daisy seemed surprisingly calm, even enjoying her new school life. Daisy, have you gotten used to your new school? I asked while making dinner together, and Daisy smiled. Yeah, I made a friend in the class next door. Already? That was fast. Daisy nodded shyly. Yeah, next time, I'm going to make meatloaf at their house. That sounds fun. Yup. Seeing her smile like a blooming flower made me smile too. Her dream is to open a restaurant. Thinking it's solid for a 10-year-old to have such a dream, Daisy shared her reason. That friend, like me, doesn't have a mom who cooks, so she cooks herself. She said she wants to cook for people who don't have someone to cook for them, like us. Is that so? I hope I can be like that too. So, I'm practicing making meatloaf. Her innocent laughter made me feel a complex emotion for a moment, but I quickly smiled back. That's great, Daisy. Your meatloaf is delicious. I want many people to taste it. Thanks. Seeing Daisy looking forward with such earnestness made her seem incredibly strong and shining. Her dream will not end in fantasy or delusion. I'm looking forward to the day when Daisy grows up and opens her restaurant.